Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. On the show today, Mimi Krodima. So Mimi uh, is a yoga teacher, a Qigong teacher. She founded, I believe, the first uh, yoga school in uh, in Beijing called Yoga Yard. She's a famous person for Tri Yoga. Uh, her YouTube channel has millions and millions of hits teaching Qigong and yoga. So I've had a lesson with her, which I very much enjoyed. Mimi, welcome. Oh, thanks, Mark. It's great to be on the show. So tell us a little bit about your story. How did you get interested in the body? Uh, my mother. <laughs> it always goes back to the mother. Okay, okay. <laughs> tell me about your mother. I feel like I should have Austrian accent for this. What happened? Was she, what was she into? Yoga? Qigong? What was the deal? Well, she was into yoga. She did yoga when she was pregnant. She had a, uh, a book from the 70s that she gave me when I was flailing around in Beijing, not very healthy, stressed, uh, really suffering. Um, but I got into the body actually before that, and it was my mother as well. Um, and that was when I was born, I had turned in toes, uh, and really kind of weak knees, weak immune system generally. But she thought because I had pigeon toed that, uh, feet that if I was sent to ballet school, that would be <laughs> That's the opposite for ballet, isn't it? It's take, if you see me on my phone, well, I forgot to say, I always take notes on my phone during these. So if anyone on YouTube is thinking, why is Mark so rude? He's texting. I'm not. I'm taking notes. Um, so she sent you to ballet school. All right. In, and in, was this, in China? Tell us the geography here. This is in the UK. In China. I was born in upstate New York. Upstate New York. Okay. So you're in upstate New York. You'd be, you're three years old and you get sent to ballet school. Well, I should be clear. Actually, I was four because we'd moved to Arizona and that's when she put me into ballet school. Uh, I was not very good. I was, I was uncomfortable in the tutu. They, uh, <laughs> they yeah. didn't progress me very far. I didn't progress myself very far. Um, by the time I was in junior high, I, I, I took an interest in dance. Uh, by the time I was in high school, I auditioned for the prima donnas, which was the modern dance troupe of University High in Tucson, Arizona. That's where we lived by then. Um, and I was never very good. <laughs> I, still, I still liked it a lot. I was um, uh, trying my best, but you know, I pursued jazz, ballet, um, modern, continued with ballet in, uh, just for technique when I was in college. And then again, it was my mother <laughs> when I was living in China, kind of backtracking to where we, we started off. She gave me this book from the 70s. It was a photocopied book. I uh, had a woman in a, a frumpy looking unitard doing some yoga, and she thought this would be good for me. So I took this photocopied book and I started doing some of the movements in it. And uh, it, immediately I felt some sort of shift and I was... Uh, really, I, I had digestive issues, I had uh, asthma, I had um, general high levels of stress. I was, I was living in China as a, I was working as a, a photojournalist at the time. Um, I had stomach ulcers that were caused by all kinds of things going wrong at the hospital. Uh, so when I started doing the practices, uh, I, I felt embodied for the first time. Um, mm -hmm quite a long time uh, that took me to you know getting more interested in in movement again and I neglected my body for many many years so getting back into my body was kind of this uh, watershed um, you know by 90 I guess 97 I left Beijing for a while and I moved back to the states and when I was in New York working I started doing some yoga classes at a local kind of community center in Brooklyn, loved it, kept it going and just at home. And by uh, the year 2000, I'd gone back to Beijing, gone back to California, ended up in Los Angeles where one of my best friends lives in, um, in Santa Monica and Venice. She took me to her yoga teacher in, uh, at the time he was teaching at Yoga Works and this was in 2000. It was just as the big boom of yoga was beginning. 
And I was going through a difficult relationship. I, uh, again, had been kind of neglecting my body. Um, and in the first five minutes of that class, I was, I was in tears, you know, it just released something really deep in me. And I was there every, every other day, pretty much <laughs> after that class. Yoga works, big boom happening, lots of great teachers around that place on that time. So who were the big influences on you? I, th I think I know at least one of them. Eric Schiffman. Yeah. Eric Schiffman. Yeah, I had a little exchange with him. He seemed like a great guy. I was kind of sad we couldn't get him for the conference because he seemed such a cool guy. I really just liked his vibe where we, where we had a little exchange of messages. He's wonderful. He's, he, yeah. Uh, so Eric Schiffman was a big influence, influence Donna Farhi later on. She's my main mentor uh, and teacher and friend. Um, and later I, I met Matthew Cohen, who was also teaching in Los Angeles around that time. He was uh, one of the first teachers at Sacred, uh, uh, Sacred Movement, which was a school founded by Max Strom and where Eric Schiffman taught, Shiva Ray, uh, Saul David Ray, Sarah Powers, all these Kind of names. They're rock stars. These are the, the, the yoga celebrities of today. All yoga celebrities existed, yeah? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, um, <clears throat> the classes I took with Matthew were, were powerful because he introduced me to Qigong. And he was blending Qigong, yoga, Tai Chi, uh, lots of different kind of movement principles. Uh, yeah. We by then had a yoga studio in Beijing. I invited him there to teach. So you kept the Chinese connection, so that wasn't just a job. There was the, you kept some sort of business connections out there. Do you have family out there? I'm trying to so understand the geography here. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I go, I, I went back and forth for uh -huh. years. Uh, I spent a total of about 13 years in Beijing, and in between some of the stays there, uh, I came back to the U.S. to work and do things. But um, in 2002, I opened the yoga st uh, studio called yoga yard it's still running it's still going it survived the pandemic it's huge now i spoke to a chinese friend just two days ago and she told she'd literally just come from china and she told me that yeah it's huge in china now yeah yeah it's huge um and so matthew trained some of our first teachers at yoga yard he was a real big influence um, he's still someone I you know, hold dear to my heart and he and I have uh, gone on to actually co-teach uh, some stuff. We did some retreats and things like that over the last few years together, which have gone really well. Uh, and he sparked this interest in Qigong, which since 2002 right. has grown in my kind of interest. And as I get older, I think it's shifted significantly more towards qigong for me um i still love yoga but i don't i don't practice it as much anymore so the question uh, i'd have for you really is what and i i'm similar journey by the way i find myself more drawn this is why i reached out to you originally was just to get some lessons and I, someone i found that I recommended and i'd heard of your teacher and someone said oh you know you should talk to me me we've got a mutual couple of friends i you know i found myself so got a bit older go okay maybe qigong is kind of appealing to me what was it that you maybe weren't getting from yoga or the appeal to you to make you say okay i want to take up this whole other practice and be a beginner again and you know it's not necessarily an easy path so what 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 how did that happen well it was such a gradual evolution since 2002 it's been woven into my asana practice and it's been kind of there right alongside my asana practice and often thrown in with it and the first time when i i did qigong with matthew uh I stood and just Tadasana, you know, but it was the, the Qigong version of it, Wuji. And my hands started getting super hot. Uh, I felt more grounded and connected to kind of a steadiness and an internal stillness than I had in all the yoga that I'd done. Um, I, f I also felt the flow of energy. And, and when I say that, it's energy. People say, well, do you believe in energy? I don't believe in energy. What is energy? Mm. It can't be conceptually described. It has to be felt. And there was a sensation there that was in some way evocative, powerful, whatever you want to call it, you felt something. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, that drew me to it immediately. The, the softness, the fluidity that drew me to it. I, um, 
as I got more interested in it, I studied with teachers who shared five element theory, five phases, and Chinese medicine. Uh, that drew me in even more. It shifted my, my health. Uh, I was fairly benefited from yoga in you know, huge capacity. And then certain things about my energy level, my digestion, my uh, sort of chronic asthma thing that was going on, all of these things were directly impacted by me starting Qigong. Understanding as well, sort of the, the, the theories behind Qigong was another level for me, um, adding on to kind of how I, how I structure my days, depending on the time of day and what activity I was doing, depending on the, the season and what was uh, the energy of the season. Uh, all of this got me more interested in Taoism, which is the kind of, you know, the, the foundation of these ideas. Definitely. Yeah. And as soon as, as soon as I jumped into the Taoist ship, I was set sailing. I just, <laughs> it's got a way of putting you in, huh? Uh, wave after wave after wave, <laughs> I'm just there. And it's just so attractive on so many levels to me in ways philosophically that I, I, I hit dead ends with, with yoga. Mm -hmm. um, Buddhism and, and Taoism have a lot more overlap for me. Uh -huh. uh, so, on, on, so to answer your question, you know, what was a shift? It was so gradual. Mm -hmm. um, I think now, particularly since the lockdown, I've had time to decide where I want to put my focus. Mm -hmm. so I'm not traveling into London. I'm like many people home. Where uh, are you based now? Oxfordshire. In, oh, so nice. um, yeah, Northwest Oxfordshire. Big garden. It's been a beautiful you know, spring, summer. And I decided, well, I want to be practicing three hours a day, doing all the things I want to do. Uh, I also want to take up an opportunity where maybe I can study with these teachers that I started studying with Beijing in Beijing, mm -hmm. another teacher, young style Tai Chi teacher in London. And I said, can we do it via Zoom? Mm -hmm. And they agreed. And that's just catapulted my, my studies. Great. It's quite an opportunity, yeah? And Same every, here. Same everything here. That I've yeah, everything that I'm drawn to do right now is internal martial arts. <laughs> yeah, for me, there was a journal of subtlety. Like I started jumping around, beating people up. And then I thought, well, maybe I could jump around without beating people up. And then I thought, maybe I could jump around a bit less. And then I thought, well, maybe I could just move and not jump and not have to do press-ups and charangas. And, and then, you know, now as I'm going, I'm not only 40 now, but I'm still going, you know, I'm, it's, more, it's not that I'm physically incapable of doing the jumping around. It just sort of bores me a bit. And what interests me more is the subtle layers mm. and the sort of subtleties and the feeling and the nuance. And it's difficult to get the nuance at a thousand miles an hour in hot yoga or hard style martial arts. The nuance is lost with the muscularity, you know, and uh, maybe it's possible to combine, but that my interest has got more and more, and you see the same thing with any art. Like if you're into food, right? People start off crude and then they normally get, you know, oh, it's a subtle wine tasting. I have gone French for this part of the interview. You know, they, they, they get more and more. French accent. Yeah, and they end up speaking a French accent. No one knows what happened, you know? But it, it's, um, just see what I mean? There's this journey to refinement and subtlety that not everyone, you don't hear of many people who start off with Tai Chi and end up with um, Koko Shinkai Karate. It tends, do you know what I mean? It tends, and sometimes people just think, oh, you're getting old and lazy and fat and tired and knackered. But I don't think it's just that because I'm actually in reasonable shape still. But um, this, this sort of interest gets more refined. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I also, I think there's something about the, uh, the age and the energy of yin and yang shifting. When mm -hmm. we're young, we have a lot more yang energy that's just in our mm -hmm. nature. We're, we're growing and we're expanding and we're exploring. And our body needs to move more. And as, as we get older, the, the yang starts to shift more towards yin. Mm -hmm. And we look a little bit more into the subtlety and the refinement yeah. and the slowing down the meditative qualities and the, the nourishing qualities, the nourishing life. I think this is important as well. When, like, when young people come to me and say, hey, should I study a martial art? I'm like, yeah, go to Taekwondo and kick someone in the head and go to Jiu-Jitsu and choke someone out. And then, but if they're 20, I say that. Yeah. And if they're 40, I might say, well, I got a systema and there's health practices and you can, you know, it's a bit more chilled now. Do you know what I mean? I feel like we should, should be aware that life change and other factors if influence that choice, right? It doesn't have to be at the same time of life. Everything is perfect for us. 
And, and that's, a, that's a really difficult concept for a lot of people in anywhere in the world, but I think particularly in Europe and America, where there's such an emphasis on exercising to feel younger. Right, right. And, and it seems to me that there's what Taoism's good at is appreciating cycles and flow. Yeah. And it, it just respects where you're at. And there's a, there's a deep respect for aging, uh-huh. unlike less. And, you know, in Tai Chi, Matthew Cohen was who kind of prompted this idea. He said, practice and train for 10 years older than you are. That's interesting. So you're sort of preparing for the age you're moving into yeah. and trying to go 10 years back, which I think is the normal thing in yoga. I see people jumping around. There's a, a sort of a desperation to it sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, got to keep, got to keep that 30, 30 year old body. It's like <laughs> you're not 30 anymore. You're 40, yeah. you're 50. Like, like, yeah, I mean, you know, being a yoga teacher can add a bit of shelf life kind of thing, but it is, it's, there's a sort of, there's an, a lack of acceptance of the aging process. Sometimes I see. Mm, yeah, I would agree. And I think it's, uh, it, it's possible within yoga, absolutely. And it's reflected in, within the yoga traditions of people who are exploring it and not seeing it as a fixed system. It, it, it's uh, the evolution of the yoga practice and the evolution of the way in which we can understand yoga and kind of take it out of the context that it's been shoved into for whatever reasons as this practice of you know, strong asana and, uh, you know, dynamic, fast practice. Uh, you know, there is a beautiful subtlety and depth to it. Um, but I think especially modern postural asana yoga, it's, it's young. And no. yeah, we're, still, yeah, yeah. we're still unsure about what that tree is yeah. going to look like. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, I think there's, um, there's some great teachers out there exploring the direction that it can go in and, uh, reaching yeah, evolve. So uh, this this is another thing that's very Taoist is appreciating context more generally, isn't it? Like because it might I know students who practice in different part of their cycle as women in different practices or seasons. Should we be doing the same practice in the depths of winter as the height of summer? Like probably not, right? Uh, and yet there's a way in which I see people looking for constancy. Like I just want to get the right formula of Wim Hof breathing and then followed by 30 minutes of, you know, Iyengar I- yoga. And it's like that formula is never going to work because you, like COVID life shifted yeah. or aging, or have you got kids or, you know, what's your work doing right now? Like my work goes in seasons of certain times a year, you know, we've got this big conference coming up. That's totally changing my practice. Cause I just got a lot less time, you know, like we have to understand context, I think to practice intelligently. Absolutely. I also think that with, uh, Taoism, there's, you know, Zhuangzi, who was one of the ancient Taoist sages, he was really fond of animals because he said animals, they are in, in tune and in touch with their innate nature. You know, they're not trying to be anything other than they are. <clears throat> Whereas human beings, I think we, we forget our innate nature and we forget our connection to this, the seasonality and the, the energies. And you look at, I look at my cats and they're very different in the summer than they are in the winter. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and most animals are. You don't have to tell them, right? You don't have, they don't have to look at their calendar and go, oh. We it's are right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, this, sorry. this is the blessing and the curse of the, the limbic uh, and the frontal cortex, right? right. <laughs> the frontal cortex can override the limbic and everything else. And, you know. uh-huh. Uh-huh. Let's take a step back. If someone said to you, I heard, Mimi, I heard you do Qigong, what's Qigong? Where would you, where would you sort of start them off with that? So awful interview question. <clears throat> I think it's such a it's such a useful question because a lot of people don't really know what it is. Um, I would I would say first of all it's it's an umbrella term that encompasses you know up to three thousand years of all movement meditation and uh, breathing practices and in that capacity because it's inclusive of all of that it's both martial it's medical and it's spiritual. And in Chinese philosophy, that's not a big deal to be all three, right? Yeah. That's a, so from the West, it's like we wouldn't go to the doctors and expect spiritual advice and him to make us a badass fighter. That yeah. would be <laughs> strange, right? You wouldn't go to the NHS and say, doctor, can I have some antibiotics? And can I work on my kick, my side kick? And, you know, that's kind of laughable. But from a, as I tell me if I'm wrong, it obviously you know more about Chinese culture than me, but from a Chinese cultural background, that's just completely common sense. It's common sense because there's not a separation of the, the, the physical, the spiritual, and the mental. It's all qi. And so, especially from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective, 
uh, the, the chi flow through your body is governed and regulated by the organ system and they can, you know, the organ system can go in and out of balance. So any practice that affects the chi is going to affect all of those, those qualities, your, your, your physical being, your emotional states, uh, your mental clarity. Uh, and exercise from the very beginning has been packaged in with self-cultivation. There's, there's sort of a few pillars that people would approach. Uh, first, you work on your virtue, which also affects our intention and our mind, and that will affect the chi. Uh, you work on your your um, the, the food you eat, so that will affect the 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 the, the chi that you take in and you use as life energy just through your 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 body digestively. Um, you work on lifestyle, so depending on when you go to sleep and when you wake up, this will affect your chi. Um, you work on meditation and breathing practices, visualization, because that will affect the the heart primarily, the heart mind and this is the supreme sovereign, like the emperor or empress of your body. Very poetic Chinese systems, emperors and empresses. <laughs> and you do movement because you need to move the chi and you need to keep the, uh, the, the body supple and you need to keep the body um, healthy and you need to keep the body fit. But you don't need to make the body superhuman and godlike, which is the avenue and the direction that the Greeks went down and that we okay. would West. The, the, the Adonis yeah. one, the physique, the statues yeah. of the yeah. superhuman, the perfect human. Bigger, uh, better, faster, and a more impossibly beautiful. Right? And this is the archetype of the faster, Greek. Stronger, more, yeah. It? yeah. <laughs> Was it faster, stronger, higher? I think that's the motto of the Olympics, which is the sort of yeah. Western idea. And I think we could probably add more beautiful on the external to Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so tell me again, what is Qigong? Okay, so it's medical, martial, and spiritual. Uh -huh. um, it is a practice that I think it, would, it, it is intended to move the chi throughout the body in an unobstructed way, so uninhibited flow of chi. Okay. One, of the, one of the hallmarks of it, I think, uh, is that it circulates the blood without taxing the lungs, and this is really important. Uh, so many things we think of as exercise have to have cardiovascular work in them. That we need to okay. you know, uh, run, swim, jog, bike, uh, do fast yoga to get the heart rate up, but the, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a Chinese idiom for everything. <laughs> and, um, one of the Chinese idioms that my teacher likes to say is han chu qi bu chan, which means the sweat pours, but the breath never quickens. The sweat pours, but the breath never quickens. Okay, okay so the idea is it's generating heat without getting yourself out of breath. And you, you see that with some of the standing poses, right? People are sweating, but they're not, they're not doing anything aerobically. If anything, they're just standing there. They're not breathing hard. They're not taxing the lungs, which in Chinese medicine are the chancellors to the heart. So you, if you want an emperor and sovereign and heart that is strong and stable, you want a second in command that's not depleted. Because the chancellor is the second in command. This is uh, it's going to confuse our German friends here. You have a, the chancellor <laughs> number yeah. one. Sorry. They, they killed their Kaiser a long time ago. They don't have Kaisers anymore. That's Emperor. Vice Premier. <laughs> vice Premier. Okay, the President is the Vice President. Okay, we've got the it. Chancellor. Okay, got it. This, both I love and this infuriates me about all Chinese arts are just <laughs> poetry in a way which is beautiful and at the same time confusing sometimes. Okay, so obviously the question now becomes, though, actually one more thing first. It's spelled in different ways. So you sent me a Facebook message which is, uh, Qigong spelled K-I-G-O-N-G, uh, like Qigong, as one word. I've seen that as two words. I've seen it spelled C-H-E-G-U-N-G. -G. And these are sort of romanizations of Chinese characters. They're, they're, they're all the same, right? There, there aren't differences there. So K would be Japanese. I don't think I would have put in K, but Q is the, the conventional spelling of Qigong. So oh, okay. Q-I, Q-I is pronounced Qi. Okay, I've also pronounced, seen it pronounced, uh, spelled C-H-I, so. It also is C-H-I, which you hear Tai Chi. Yeah. Those two Chi's don't refer to the same thing at all. They don't refer to the same thing. Okay, that's great to know. Say the difference. So Qi Gong, Qi is life energy. Uh -huh. It's, uh, you know, everything that is animating the world, re refined or more dense. Tai Chi, uh, Tai Chi or Tai Chi, J-I. G means ultimate 
for um, uh, the, ac the, the axis. So um, Tai Chi would be the supreme ultimate axis. Modest. It's such a modest name, isn't it, Tai Chi? Very modest. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, so even though one is, are they pronounced the same or am I missing an inflection? I know Mandarin's got all these inflections that I might be missing. Is that, so is it just spelled differently or is it pronounced differently? It's a, well, they're two different characters. They're two different pronunciations. Part of the, the mess that we've inherited is China's civil war. So when the Taiwanese and the Chinese communist government had a civil war, Taiwan broke off you know, the, the, the KMT Kuomintang broke off from mainland China and established its own republic in, in Taiwan. They developed a romanization system called Wade Giles. Okay. And, and that has, well, that was the first generation of exported romanization to the West. So you get things like spelling Tai G as T-A-I-C-H-I. Then along comes the Chinese romanization, which is called Pinyin. And it can its own interpretations on how to Romanize Chinese. And that was a later exporting, but as mainland China grew in, uh, you know, sort of grew on the world stage, so to say, like the standardization for Romanization switched over to mainland Chinese versions, which is Pinyin, it's kind of considered the worldwide standard. So that's the QI. Okay. And it's okay. IG, it's T-A-I-J-I in the, mainland Chinese romanization. Gong. So and it's it's just the same as Kung, like Kung Fu, Qigong, Qigong. Kung Fu. Kung Fu should be pronounced in, in Mandarin, Kung Fu. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I'm feel, I'm, this is great. One of my students said, I've studied Japanese martial arts. And he said, what's the difference between Japanese and Chinese martial arts? And I said, well, it's a big subject. And I'm not an expert, but I said, Chinese martial arts are complicated and they're confusing and ambiguous and poetic they were the first and i said look i don't know for sure but they were the first words that came to mind like it's big china's a huge country and it's complicated and at the same time there's ambiguity like characters can mean different things and is, is that a fair description of like the, the world we're getting into here well i think it comes back to the dao the dao is the Tao is everything and cannot be named. It is the ultimate mystery and yet what animates all things. And so you have a, a, a foundational religious and philosophical tradition based on not having strict definitions. Right. So it's, it's very sort of Western scientific to say, but what exactly is a quark? You know, what, how, how many centimeters is a meter? You know, it's very specific. And the Chinese eyes will be, well, it sort of depends, right? You know, it depends on the context. Like, no, 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 but is it 100 centimeters or 101? You know, there's a way in which I, I always want to pin things down when I talk to Qigong or Tai Chi teachers. And they never let me pin them down. It's like trying to knit fog. And let me try and pin you down then. What is Qi, what is Qi or Qi? What is Qi from the Qigong? What is, what is that? Qi. Qi, one of the best, so let me back up. Qi in Chinese culture is in everything. It's, it's just it woven into the fabric of the language. Tian qi is the weather. Qi se is the color of your face. Sheng qi is to get angry. So it's, it's just the manifestation of energy. One of the best definitions I know of is qi is the energetic blueprint that gives rise to the formation of all matter. So, uh, one more time slowly, I like yeah. it. One more time. Energetic blueprint that gives rise to the formation of all matter. So, so the, 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 the energetic blueprint. What does energetic mean here? Help me out. Well, let, let's just, I'll back it up in a minute. Sure. The, the energetic blueprint that gives rise to all matter. So, um, this was in a, a book I read from, uh, by, uh, uh, it's called The Spark in the Machine. And he's a Western doctor who has studied Chinese medicine. And he says, Western medicine is stumped at embryology. They don't know where and how there's, you know, it, it comes into existence, what that spark creates, how we, we grow in a, in a very differentiated kind of and unique way. So embryology is kind of stumping Western medicine. But the Chinese have said, no, oh, it's just cheap. And that's the reason why there is differentiation in the world. So rocks come out of the earth 
not as one solid, you, you know, similar mass, same height, same quality, rock emerges from the earth in variation and in different form and shape and color and texture. That's chi. So it's this, we can't say what energy is. We can't say what chi is. Science can't say what it is, but it is so just embedded into the way in which the Chinese have always looked at where things come from and why there's differentiation. So chi, okay, let me, let me back this up again. We got time. So, so there was something soupy, undifferentiated, a state of oneness called primordial chi. And this is before anything, it came into existence. There was this hun dun, this is primordial chi. And then the belief is that that primordial chi at some point started to differentiate itself into uh, uh, yin and yang, rarefied and dense chi. Those then split into heaven as yang chi and earth as yin chi. And as those types of that primordial chi differentiated into these two types of yin and yang chi, you had this movement and cyclical pattern of balance within the wholeness. And within yin and yang, what people often forget is that the seed of yin is always within yang and vice versa. Side note, this is why people who sometimes do yin yoga are so flabbergasted by qigong, because yin yoga is flopping. They think it's yin. But when they start to move, they think that's yang. And with qigong, you, you never separate them. The Chinese have never separated them. They're always together. Mm-hmm. And the orientation and, and, and integrity of practice is the balance of the two. Right, right. The, the idea of yin, yeah. yoga, or yang, yeah. anything would be... To primordial oneness into differentiation. You get then this sense of <clears throat> uh, yin and yang, heaven and earth, and then riding onto the backs of yin and yang where the, this is how the creation story goes, where the myriad creatures, and they created everything that we know, but they also brought in the, the five elements and the five phases, or the five phases and the seasons. And within that, there's a very syncretic view of each season relates to each element or phase. Each phase has a corresponding organ system within the body, uh, For example, fire, summer, the season we're in, has the heart, the pericardium, the heart protector, the small intestine, uh, which is like the filter for the heart, and something called the triple triple heater, which is like a thermostat. All these four organs relate to fire phase. Within the fire element organs, then you have a differentiation of times of day that they're more active. Uh, and, and it kind of gets, you know, they have specific emotions that they correspond to, colors, sounds, odors, uh, characteristics, in or out of balance. All of this, though, is the same stuff as primordial chi. So everything that is happening, the chi flow through your organs and meridians is handed down from and a product of that original primordial chi that split into yin and yang that differentiated further into the five phases and seasons and organs. And so we are a manifestation of the oneness of everything that's out there. I just packed a, like a book into that's, you know, yeah, three paragraphs. <laughs> yeah. Dad, Jing or something, you could spend like an, you know, an hour on each little chapter, couldn't you? <laughs> there's, there's a but, lot there. Okay, maybe we should take a breath, you know? It feels like... <laughs> but yes, you know, she is, and that's my most straightforward, you know, uh, way to contextualize and, and, and explain it. Great, great effort, because not an easy thing to do. I've asked a bunch of teachers that have been on, and it's, it's, a, it's not an easy question. I'm aware of that. Um, do you think it's useful for people that didn't have that sort of Chinese context of language and all the idioms and, you know, all the ways of looking at qi as just part of life? Do you think it's useful for them to take it on? I'm not sure myself because I've seen people take on the idea and almost like treat it as a sort of magic power or a way to be special or something else. And I've gone, okay, how much do you have to be in that kind of cultural context to really get it? You know, I, I know teachers who are, well, let me back up. Your question is, it sounds like 
people who are just starting to get into it and dabbling in it, how appropriate is it for them to, to take on? Generally, yeah. as Westerner or non, non seeker, non idea of cheat, even. Is that a useful concept for people to take on? Yeah, I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. I think, though, that having a good teacher is like in any practice, in any tradition, really key. And if you have a good teacher, that teacher won't emphasize the orientation or practice as anything special. I mean, this is okay, so this is the thing that I really, really love about Taoism and Qigong is that the true masters don't want to be found. <laughs> Bit of a bugger huh? makes, makes it tricky. Why don't they want to be found? Humility. Uh huh. Uh, you know, not a need to prove anything. Um, the sense that when you find unity and oneness of the Tao, it's nothing special. That there's the unity with the Tao is, Drums has described it as the great, as as high as the heavens, <clears throat> and as low as the shit and piss. <laughs> nice. And that's a huge relief for me. It's like, I can do all these practices and all I'm doing is merging with what one historian described as the great clod of earth. H.R. Creel, the great clod of earth. Of earth. There's, there's something that like appeals to me about Taoism that it has this ordinariness to it or the magic of the ordinary is somehow it feels to me. Precisely. It's the mystery, the ineffable, the impossible, the the um, unfathomable simplicity of any moment. Mm, mm. That is, oh, it's like, thank goodness. There's no, there's no, there's no goal that's lofty. There's no kind of special experience to be had. It's just. And that does contrast a little bit with some things in yoga culture, doesn't it? The sort of the God realm, I'm going to be this magnificent sort of Greek God combined with Indian magic powers, combined with, uh, you know, massively sexy, but let's not pret let's pretend that's not happening, combined with I'm going to be a celebrity, but let's pretend that's not happening, and I'm going to have all these, you know, that's very much like the rock star yoga teacher. It's like the opposite of that. Was, there's a tension there, right? <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you teach at Tri Yoga. It's a, I love Tri Yoga, and it's also it is the home of the rock star yoga teacher in London. It's uh, you know, there's some famous teachers there. There's some big egos there. And, uh, you know, I actually really like it to be clear, and I definitely will come back when I'm in London. And there's no doubt about it. It's not exactly a Taoist place, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um. What if so? Can I read you something? Please go for it. Um. Yeah. So, in answer to this, the nine basic precepts from um, the, the second century AD, so this is the Han Dynasty, that a Taoist priest or priestess, and this is the other thing I love about Taoism, that women have had a role. There have been it, the high sort of points of Taoist culture, which is the Tang Dynasty, the Han Dynasty, there were up to half the, the clergy members were women, and, and they were actually considered people who could advance more quickly uh, to this simple oneness of the Tao than, than men. Um, anyway, so these precepts were ones that they took, and you, know, you think about the yogic precepts and the Taoist precepts, or yogic yamas and niyamas, you know, it's, it's quite like, you know, don't use your sexual energy inappropriately, don't steal, don't, you know, don't harm, things like that, and they're good. But these are the nine Taoist ones. First, do not strongly pursue riches and honor if you happen to be poor and humble. Good enough. Do not do evil. Great. Do not set yourself many taboos and avoidances. So that's an interesting one because in a lot of the yogic contexts, you, you would do quite extreme things to become one with... Just, just a shout out to all the vegans out there at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so middle path, right? Uh -huh. Don't do anything extreme. No, no, too many taboos and avoidances. Um, next, do not pray or sacrifice to demons of the spirits of the dead. Fair enough. And then here is where I get really interested. Do not strongly oppose anyone. Interesting. This is a vow. This is a precept. So you're not going to be with your placard outside the building chanting and sort of, you know, <laughs> screaming at the sky and all that stuff. It gets better. It gets better, Mark. Do not consider yourself always right. It's a good reminder for me. Appreciate that. 
I, I think I, know, I like these and need these, so maybe I should, I should print this out somewhere and put it on my wall. Next. This is, this is even better, okay? Do not quarrel with others over what is right and wrong. If you get into a debate, be the first to concede. Especially on Facebook. <laughs> woman from the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago predicting the future perfectly. So what are these called? And these are great. I really like these. These are, these are like the Taoist commandments, right? What, yeah. what are they? What yeah. are, what the, are they nine bas- the basic nine precepts in the Xiang Er commentary from um, the, the, they're the celestial masters who took these. In a way, though, I've, I've precepts are themselves not very Taoist, are they, in a way? Do you know what I mean? No, no that's not true. So, um, you know, this is a common misunderstanding, is that Taoism became a very strong religion in China, uh, uh, especially as Buddhism came into China. So it had to compete, and then they set up um, religious centers, they had precepts, they, they they had gods that they, you know, could become, and there are lots of Taoist gods. Or god of money? Is he Taoist? Yeah. Is the god of money Taoist? I heard there's a god of money in China. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, you can go and pray to that god of money. But ultimately, again, all of these these gods, if you become a Taoist god, you're still just a clod of earth. You're still just soupy primordial oneness. (laughs) It's humbling. Um, I like it. I like it. This one. This is great. Do not praise yourself as a sage of great fame. Even on Instagram. Come on. Maybe. Uh, Let me do that on Instagram at least. How am I going to get any customers? Oh, my God. So is it, how do you, because you're kind of a bit of a rock star, you know, you're, you're, uh, how many millions of hits? Um, no, I am me, myself, and I am person. Yeah. I just, I have no assistants. I have no agents. I, you know, I have a literary agent, but that was like someone who came to me. I didn't go looking for that person. Sure, sure. I'm not saying you have a big ego and you've been very chill to work with. I've never had a bad experience there, but you also, you know, you're in the world. You've got... 10 million hits on YouTube or whatever. And, you know, and I, you know I've never, I so, I'm so bad at YouTube and I don't really use it. And I just put it up there and I'm bad at returning comments to people's questions. Someone produced those videos. They're nicely oh, done. Come me, on. my husband. Really? Oh, that was nicely done. It was nicely done. They're very beautiful. I recommend them to people. Just as we're at, if people wanted to check out a video on YouTube, what would be a good one to, for beginners to start with, with the Qigong? Maybe it if they want to like the eight brocades. Eight brocades. Yeah, one of my students, by the way, says, thank you. I just talked to her. She says she's doing that every day, and she really likes it. Oh, cool. But there's so, a thing, Liz, my student. Let me just um, backtrack to the original reason I read you these precepts, because you said, you know, I'm at Tri-Yoga. When it, you know, how do I reconcile that? that? And this, the precepts are how I reconcile that. I don't, you know, they do what they do, and that's great, and I do what I do, and that's fine, and I'm not in any need to, you know, say what someone else is doing is right or wrong. Um, yeah, but, you know, racism is a different issue, but I'm not going to go there right now. But it, the, the thing is, is it, it's a, the Taoists say act, but never do any violence, never aggressively act, but never seek the, the, the praise for it, you know, act, do things. It doesn't say don't do anything. Um, okay. but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't say like, you know, oppose something really strongly. And, and so it makes room for everything and it changes with the times this is the Taoist principle as well. And so, you know, I, I'm very grateful to try yoga. I love try yoga. And I think it's, you know, it, but it's like anything and it's, it's a work in progress. Just want to say I'm not slagging try tri- yoga. I've had <laughs> yeah. Or you can eat buffet for 30 days and move to London. <laughs> yeah. Loads of great teachers there. Loads of friends I've met there. I, I love, I love it. I love it. So I'm not slagging it off and I'm, I'm not being political when I say that. I genuinely think it's a good place. So. Yeah. All right. Good. So uh, anything you want to say about how this Taoist work or the Qigong sort of applies to our times right now? Well, there's, you know, various politics going on. Uh, you said you don't want to talk about racism. You are welcome to if you want to uh, and equally not to. Uh, equally, the COVID times, we're sort of maybe moving out of, fingers crossed. Anything that kind of relates to current times that might be interesting? Well, I always said I didn't want to talk about racism because it's such a big issue for me. I mean, being a person of color, having grown up with a family that was, you know, we're the only Chinese family within miles and miles in Arizona. Um, But, you know, just that I feel that one of the things that Taoism says is that effortless action, wu wei, and spontaneity, naturalness, zi they go hand in hand 
but they're often misconstrued as either Wu Wei inaction, not acting, or spontaneity and naturalness as doing whatever the hell you want. Right, so some just near enemies there, huh? And so, yeah, exactly. But when understood correctly, Wu Wei is the appropriate action without strife and struggle. So the foundations of Taoism, simplicity, humility, compassion, you have to do anything that you undertake, you do with compassion and humility uh, and, and patience and simplicity. Uh, so struggle against racism, fight racism, speak out against racism, but from a place that's worked through the reactivity and the anger and the hatred and the pain to a place that's more wise and compassionate spontaneity, naturalism, misunderstood as just uh, carelessness or whimsical or, um, uh, you know, do anything that you want to do. No, it's actually, you have to know everything. You have to know and be informed about everything before you can be free from the tyranny of right and wrong. And then you can act spontaneously and freely, but you have to educate yourself along the, the spectrum of everything that's happening before you can then be free to, to not take sides strongly or to see past the, 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 the trap of, pol you know, the, the polarity and you can see into the wholeness. Um, and so that's an invitation to cultivate and read and understand and get informed. And then you can act from a place that's free. I will not ruin that by adding anything to it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So whether that's racism or it's COVID or it's politics, you know, that's where I put my intention and where I put my, my Left head. or right, it definitely sounds like some medicine that could be really helpful right now. So I hope people take that one on. <laughs> one question which I thought was a really interesting, simple question, which very rarely guests ask, which is why don't more people do Qigong. So normally people come on and they're enthusiastic. They're like, everyone should do five rhythms. Everyone should do sistema. Everyone should do yoga. And it's like, okay, cool. But why don't they? So I'm like, why do you think that is? Oh, I think one reason is it's not been marketed very well and it's not very marketable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Potential so, issue here. Okay. Go on. Um, you have people, you look, you have people doing Qigong martial arts wearing pajamas versus uh -huh. Well, doing yoga and other things, wearing lycra and skimpy outfits. Okay, so the outfits are less sexy. That's, 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 that's the first thing. Is there something about it not giving that quick fix as well? Like, like, like I find when you go to yoga, you just immediately get a bit of an endorphin bars and you stretch and it's hard. You feel like you're doing something hard. And afterwards, you're lying in Shavasana and you're a little bit sort of endorphin stoned. Mm. And, you know, you're going to get that. Whereas not necessarily, with you know, in my experience of, say, doing Tai Chi, is you might just spend half an hour annoyed and it's kind of difficult and there isn't that glow necessarily at the end. So it doesn't necessarily give that quick win. Yeah, people like to shop around a lot now and they like to... Um, it, like you said, have something immediate and anything that I feel that you learn <laughs> takes time. And it, it, the, when you invest in that time and you, you give it the respect and the depth and the commitment um, that say learning a language is, is able to give and reciprocate. If you, if you really feel then like you can go to France and speak French, you know, it takes time, but the rewards are great. Mm -hmm. And the, the same thing is true with these deeper martial and Qigong practices that they're frustrating at the beginning and, and they're the type of things that take that deep respect and time and, and patience and dedication to learn. So a lot of people these days don't want to do that. Uh, I think they, and it's not necessarily to any fault of their own, they, they're, you know, busy, they don't have time, they, uh, they feel like they need a, a pill instead of alternative therapy, which is slow. They, they want to take mm -hmm. a pill that takes away their disease or pain or, or anxiety or headache or whatever it is um, versus changing the way that they eat, going to bed at a different time, uh, you know, <laughs> regulating their exercise. And so, yeah. you know, but you, you can't put, you can't, you can't expect to eat a, a, a head of lettuce if you don't put the seed in the ground first, put, put a little water in the soil, give it some sunshine, protect it from the wind, 
then letting it grow and eventually a few months later you've got a beautiful head of lettuce yeah take time and i think people are just so unwilling um, to respect that they just want to go to the supermarket and pick the head of lettuce yeah and you miss the stage. Then you feed the lettuce to an animal and then you've got something tasty. No, no <laughs> stage there, Mimi. But I, I was with you. I was with you. I thought there was going to be a cow or a rabbit at least involved. Okay, good. Mimi, this is a delight as ever. You're a total pleasure. I love, I love a lot of the stuff you've said. You've made things simple. I think the Taoism is so important for today. Is there anything? We still have a few minutes here. So is there anything that you haven't covered that you would have liked to talk about? Oh gosh, you know, I think you you're the you're the one kind of, you know, with some questions and you know who your your audience might be and what they might be interested in. Um, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. I think this was great and um you know, we normally end by saying do you have a closing message about the body and first of all like where do people find you online? I know you're a Taoist sage so you don't want to be found, but I think there is some kind of a humble website out there. Uh mkdema.com, right? That's yeah, that's MK, like MK Ultra, Dima, D E E M for Mark E R, Dima.com. Is that the one you want to point people to? Yeah, that's that's fine. Thank you, Mark. No, right. and, you know, I, that's, you know, Taoist sages never want to be found. And we're, I'm not a hermit. I'm, I'm sort of doing a hermit light now that we're out in the countryside, which is great. I have a huge love of hermits. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think. There's, there's, you know, the, the modern kind of incarnation of, of, uh, of teachings is that there's the world that's in pain and we need to do what we can to, to remedy that and give some medicine out. And Taoist sages have often just, not that I'm saying anything that, you know, is we're equating this, but like a Taoist will hermit himself or herself. Some, some have even missed the entire cultural revolution <laughs> in China. But they'll also... Good dodge. Yeah. Like, what happened? Um, and then, but they also recognize when there's need in, in society mm -hmm. and, and to move back into society when they think that there's the balance of the Tao. It's, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's, did you see Avatar? Uh, yes, yes. The <laughs> so, first the action movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we watched Avatar recently, but, yes. you know, Ewa, who's the, 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 the kind of the Tao, right? Or she, the spirit of that planet ensures balance. And this is, this is, you know, I think what this world is crying out for is this recalibrating and this rebalancing out of what's become kind of a massively imbalanced uh, predilection to destruction uh, so, you know, destruction of ourselves, destruction of the, the planet. So I think, you know, if we have something within us to, um, support the rebalancing of that, uh, and, and, you know, the beautiful thing is, is that you don't have to go out and proselytize anything. You can just do it for yourself. And the Taoists believe we're part of nature, you know, we're nature manifest in human form. There's no separation. And if you take care of yourself, you're taking care of everything around you. It's not narcissistic. It's not anything other than you're part of this. I'm looking out there because it's grass and trees. Right, right. We're part of this and we forget, you know, we somehow think we're separate from nature. This idea we've inherited from uh, Cartesian thinking and from uh, you know, the likes of uh, early, early enlightenment thinkers, but that wasn't, hasn't always been the case. And so I think we can also learn from the Taoist just that you can just take care of yourself. And that's, that's enough, enough. When you, when you do that, everything else will kind of flow out in a way that will feel much more kind and much more gentle to the world. It's a lovely place to end. I think Mimi, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks Mark. Pleasure. Thanks. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it. Um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it old school. Um, yeah. Really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's 
less than a pound if you're in UK ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes, um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the Embodiment Podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So, um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on embodiedfacilitator.com website, uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up, and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list, and get involved on the Facebook. There, Whew, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.